Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the first revision class for F8 Audit and Assurance for the December 2016 ACCA exams, due to take place, of course, on Monday the 5th of December, so just over three weeks away. This is the class that replaces our doomed attempt to run a live class on Monday of this week, four nights ago. Uh, our apologies for that. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that having identified control deficiencies within our systems here, uh, and recommendations were very brief, uh, quickly made, largely by me, uh, the good news is we have done some major improvement work on our IT uh, and our internet connection, which should now mean everything's going to be fabulous. So hopefully no more problems and good evening. So, uh, we start. Uh, we have got four two and three quarter hour sessions of revision. Good evening. Uh, those sessions will of course be tonight uh, and then on three successive Mondays. So we go back to the scheduled Monday nights. Two hours and 45 minutes is a long time to go without a break. So we will be running the class around about an hour and 20, hour and a half. Then we'll take uh, about a 15 minute break and then we'll come back for a final hour. In addition to the four live revision classes, uh, recordings of which will go up onto your Canvas platform. Uh, the Monday classes will go up on the following day, Tuesday. Uh, tonight's class won't go up until Monday uh, because the person who does that job does not work at the weekend, so you'll get it on Monday. Um, in addition to that, you will also find hitting Canvas over the next few days a few extra bits and pieces. The first of those went up today, the must, should, could, prioritise list of questions. Looking at all of the questions from the last, ooh, about five or six years of exams, which is plenty of papers to practise. And we divide them into those we really think you have to do, those that you really ought to do, and those that you can do if you have enough time. So focus on the must questions first, then the shoulds, then the coulds. I've designed it to make sure that the musts cover all essentials, all main question types. Uh, the shoulds are more of the same type as the musts, plus a few that are a little bit odder, and more less likely, sorry, uh, to come up. Uh, and the coulds are basically just repeat types of what you've already done. Uh, as you might imagine, on these revision sessions, I will be focusing very heavily on must questions because if I think they're that important, naturally, I want to do them. Also being added in the next few days will be uh, some examiner articles. Generally not the actual examiner article because you've got that on ACA Global anyway, freely available. Uh, but what I like to do is go through those articles and provide my own summaries of them, especially the most recent ones. Now, as you should be aware, audit reports have changed relatively recently. Uh, they changed for the September sitting. So this is the second sitting with the new audit report being tested. <coughs> uh, and it is quite clear that the new audit report is a little bit more complicated only a little bit, but a little bit more technically difficult than the old audit report. The P7 Advanced Audit Examiner yesterday issued a new article on ACA Global designed for P7 students. It is therefore on the P7 page, but not on the F8 page. Having said that, everything in that article is just as examinable for you guys, to be honest. Now, audit reports have become technically quite tricky, so she's not going to get quite as involved with the new stuff as the P7 examiner will. But you might want to go to the P7 page on ACA Global and just take a look at that. Now, that means that I think I'm right. We've had about four articles about audit reports in the last four or five years. I have produced a summary article to try and pare all this down to the essentials 
uh, and that article will be going up at the start of next week. I have written it. I just want to go through it and make absolutely sure I'm happy with it, just to make sure we get this as right as we can do. Uh, as we currently stand, we have not had any additional articles from the F8 examiner or her team since the September exam. But there must be a chance we might get one. I, of course, look at the ACCA page every day on your behalf, but keep uh, your own lookout as well, just in case we get one, because generally, if an article comes out on any topic, it is likely to have an impact on the exam paper at the next sitting. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, also, a reminder, two other things, very important. Um, what are we today? We are there. So, uh, at some point next week, the mock exam window opens. Now, we would love to have the mock exam window after all the revision classes, and we could do. The only problem being, you wouldn't get a marked exam back, because we wouldn't have time to mark them, given we like to give extensive written feedback to give you something useful. So we have to have the window earlier to give you a chance to get some feedback. I know revision won't have been completed, but if you are seriously sitting there telling me I cannot possibly attempt questions on some things until we've done revision, then you have left your preparation very, very late. Revision is meant to be bringing things together for you, not taking you from zero to hero. So my advice is have a go at the mock. When I mark the mock, I don't get too excited about technical mistakes. I'll point them out, but you know, they're not that crucial. You have time to solve those. What I'm looking for is how you seem to have gone about that type of question and how you are explaining yourself in the answers. Because whether you've started or finished revision, I doubt how you explain yourself is going to change much until someone tells you you're doing it wrong. So please have a go at the mock. Give me something I can give you some feedback on. Even if you don't attempt the whole thing, doesn't matter. Have a go at it, submit it, and let's see what I can tell you to assist. Uh, I should point out from my experience, the results on people's mock exams tend to be a very good prediction of what then happens on the actual exam day. So it's a good opportunity to find where you are at and where some help may boost your mark. In addition to the mock exam, I should also point out that after the four revision classes, on either the Thursday or the Friday, December the 1st or 2nd, so three or four days before your actual paper, we will have a final one hour question and answer session. The panic room, as I like to call it, where I will deal with any questions you choose to throw at me. I will also use that opportunity to tell you what I would tell you if I met you half an hour before the real exam. So we'll cut out all the detail and it will all be about approach and how you should deal with the exam on Monday the 5th. Okay, time to get going. And a few things I need to remind you of before we get going. So, the exam paper you are going to sit will start with 15 multiple choice questions. Just a reminder that these are now in the format of a single uh, sort of long question scenario. And from that question, instead of you having to write sentences, there will be five multiple choice questions questions. Now those are mostly going to test your knowledge and some understanding. There won't be much in there that is practical and application. So if you know your stuff and you understand the content of this course, you should score pretty well on those. Given that they are mostly knowledge, given that the correct answer is sitting staring you in the face, 
surrounded by some wrong answers, I appreciate. Um, and given that, well, one quarter of those you would get right just by pure guessing, statistically speaking, I'm rather hoping that you should be scoring 20 out of 30 on those. I would say anything less than 67% on the MCQs suggests that you have not spent enough time getting the basic knowledge and understanding in place. This is not a complicated paper. Possibly with the exception of audit reports, there's nothing here that you should need to spend half an hour thinking about. The theories, the logic, the process is all pretty straightforward. So if you put in the effort, you should score well on the MCQs. And then we have the three long questions. A total of 70 marks. <coughs> 30, 20 and 20. And the majority of the marks in those three questions are going to be on three big core practical areas. Audit risk and response. Internal controls. and substantive procedures. Now that should make our lives a little easier than the old exam format, when the long questions would certainly cover those three core areas, but would also cover a lot of other bits and pieces as well. And with every question being compulsory, I think it made it a little more difficult. Now we know for sure that if you can handle an audit risk and response question, you can deal with internal control objectives, procedures, and tests of control, and you can come up with substantive procedures for different areas of the accounts and for situations provided to you in the story. You are going to score very well out of those 70 marks. So the key to this exam is very, very straightforward. Priority number one is 70 marks, not 30. Priority number one, is you must be good at those three things. There's not much to know. It is all about technique. It doesn't take long to explain. But as with most things that are technique, it doesn't take long to explain it. It takes a while to practice it until you can see how to put that technique in place and it starts to become natural. It's a bit like juggling. Juggling three balls is easy. It looks easy, and it doesn't take long for me to explain the technique to you. You throw that one, but before it lands, you throw that one, and before it lands, you throw that one, so it's just dun, 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 dun. It's easy. Doesn't mean it's easy to do, though, until you practice it a bit, after which it's easy. So, focus on knowing the technique, practicing the technique, and on exam day, thinking the technique and doing it. If you do all of that, you'll score well on the long questions and you will pass this exam. We have had the same examiner since 2010. Uh, she is now sharing the question writing responsibilities, we believe. Nobody tells you this stuff for sure, by the way. Uh, so there's a little more variety. It's not necessarily all her. But the style of questions on this paper has not changed for years. So you've got no excuses. There are plenty of old exam questions, plenty we can practice. And once we've gone through one or two additional little points, that is exactly what we are going to do. Right, how do we go about the questions? Tip number one. Typically, uh, when we mark this exam, we mark it in halves. You get a half for saying something 
and a half for saying why. Inspect the invoice. Right, what for? Inspect the invoice, half a mark, to verify the date and the cost that was uh, paid for the item. Do that to verify that. That is an audit risk because be do be do be do. I would issue a qualified except for opinion in the audit report because be do be do be do. Explanations, very, very important. A lot of students who fail the exam do so because they have spotted issues, but they write virtually nothing. Now, obviously, two to three lines is going to vary on the size of your handwriting. <clears throat> so another way to look at it, I would be aiming to write about... Well, I would say if you're writing anything less than about 12 to 15 words, and preferably about 20, anything less than that, and there's a risk it doesn't make enough sense. <coughs> Third point. This exam is a real-time exam. What does that mean? Well, you are sitting it on Monday the 5th of December 2016. <coughs> so if the question says in August 2016, what it's actually saying is about three and a half months ago. If it says in December 2015, it's saying one year ago. So watch that very carefully. But it's not just about the dates that things did happen, it's also about the dates that things are going to happen. So if you're doing, for example, an audit risk and response question, then you are planning an audit. Typically, we plan audits before the accounting year has finished. But we don't do the audit work then, we are planning it with a view to doing it about two to three months after the year end. <coughs> so, if you're doing an audit risk and response question, and let's say the story says, there is a court case currently going on, uh, the company are being sued. Hopefully you think court case equals provisions, maybe contingent liabilities. And if you're going to say provision, then one of the problems is knowing what the right figure should be. What will this cost the company? Well, don't forget, the court case might be going on at the moment, but you will be doing your audit testing after the year end, which I'm guessing is going to be in about two to three months time, when the court case may well have finished, in which case you'll know exactly how much it has cost the company. <coughs> so watch the dates very carefully and think about the audit process and when you would have done something and when you are going to do something. A lot of what the examiner is testing is do you understand the audit process and where in that process you are currently placed. Okay. <coughs> I must apologise. <coughs> there is something about this studio, I don't know what it is, which makes me cough whenever I come in here. Uh, okay, that's enough about general technique at the moment. We need to start getting into the longer questions. But to intersperse the longer questions, we do also need to focus on some knowledge. So in between the various long questions, I'll be reminding you of some of the things you need to know and maybe more importantly, needs to understand and be able to explain. 
So what we're going to do is a couple of those to start off, get our brains warmed up a bit, and then we'll go into the first potential long question area, which is not one of the big three, but is something which might form part of one of those longer questions. But before we get to that, let us begin with a bit of technical recap. <coughs> this course is called Audit and Assurance. Virtually the entire course is about the external audit of a set of a company's financial statements. But there are a few other bits on the course as well, and one of the things you need to be able to deal with is what exactly is assurance and what levels of assurance might come up. Uh, just before I do that, Ashok asks a question. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, I don't really think it matters. A um, couple of thoughts I would have on it, though. Um, thought number one, MCQs or long questions first? Well, thought number one, uh, you can't guess long question answers if you're running out of time. If you leave the MCQs till the end, if you've only got 30 seconds left and five questions because your time management's been a disaster, in the last few seconds, you could just go and cross off some letters and hope you get lucky. So maybe that's one reason for doing the MCQs at the end. Second reason, the MCQs focus on knowledge. A bit of understanding, but mostly knowledge. Whereas the long questions require technique. I doubt you will forget your knowledge during the course of the exam you will forget your exam technique because you'll forget you need to do it. And for that reason, I would also say, at the beginning, focus on finding out what the long questions are asking and scribble down on the question paper the exam technique for that type of question before you forget it. And a third reason I'd probably say do the MCQs at the end is it may well be that within the long questions, there are some bits of knowledge that you end up talking about which help you answer the MCQs when you get to do them. I'm not convinced it works so well the other way around. So if it was me, uh, I would focus on 70 marks ahead of 30. I would do the long questions first and I would do the MCQs at the end. Or I suppose do the long questions and when your hand, your writing hand, starts to get a bit uh, pained because of all the words and sentences you're writing, why not give yourself a little break and go do the MCQs, which don't really involve any writing, do they? So maybe do them in the middle, but I doubt I'd do them first. I can't see the point of doing them first. Anyway, there you go. Right, levels of assurance, our first bit of technical revision. <coughs> Assurance is about giving confidence to people and you can give people a lot of confidence or you can give people a bit of confidence. So it comes in different levels. And the best way of understanding this is to compare what the most of this course is about, the audit of financial statements, with something else, a review assignment. In an audit, We do relatively detailed testing. You know the stuff, analytical, inquiry, inspection, observation, and recalculation. And we do that because we have no choice. <clears throat> the audit standards tell us that's what we're meant to do, and the law forces auditors to do detail. 
Because we have tested things in detail, we should be reasonably assured. In other words, fairly confident of our opinion. <coughs> and therefore, when we give our opinion in the audit report, we are going to use positive language, or as your examiner seems to like to call it, positive assurance. <clears throat> now, when we say positive, we don't mean good news necessarily. What we mean is that when you express your opinion, you express it in a manner that says you are fairly positive, you are right. You sound fairly sure. You don't sound 100% sure, but you sound pretty sure. <coughs> and as a result of that, you give your opinion in words like, the financial statements are true and fair, or the financial statements are not true and fair, not good news, but you still sound fairly positive, or I suppose, except for something, the financial statements are true and fair. The point is that in all of those examples there, all three of them, you sound fairly sure. <coughs> What's a review assignment? Well, let's imagine a company comes to your firm of accountants and says, hello, we've prepared our accounts, we've checked and we don't need to have them audited. Uh, we are a small company and we've been told we do not need legally to have an audit. But we'd still quite like someone to check our accounts for our own purposes because we'd quite like to know if we're doing them right. And also, we don't need an audit this year, but next year will probably be big enough to need one. So without the pressure of legally having to have it done, and without the pressure of legally having to have it done by a given deadline, and without the need to pay you a full fee for doing it, could you check our accounts a little bit? Not the full audit with all the paperwork and nonsense, but could you do a sort of half audit. <clears throat> and that is one of the reasons that firms of accountants do things called review assignments. It's not just clients who want their accounts checked but not fully audited. It could be anything else that they want a little bit checked. The nature of review assignments is less detailed testing is done. Uh, if you want to know what that actually means, it means you still do the A and the E, but we don't do so much I, O and U. Uh, why are you doing less detailed tests? Because there's no law saying you have to do detail. Maybe there's not enough time to do detail. Maybe the client simply doesn't want to pay for detail. But just to make it very, very clear, when you are checking the accounts for a company that has to have them audited, it must be positive assurance. Audits are always positive assurance. <clears throat> so, less detailed tests. As a result, limited assurance is provided. So it's still some assurance, but less confidence because less testing has been done. As a result, oh, don't say audit, Paul. Bad mistake. 
This can't be an audit, it's a review. Your review report at the end <coughs> is going to use negative assurance or negative wording, in other words. And therefore, you are going to say something like, Nothing came to our attention to suggest the figures or information are not true and fair. So the key point there. is the negative comes from the fact that you are using negative words, nothing, not. So, that is the difference between a detailed audit, which is what accounts typically need, and review assignments, which are done on other jobs, typically where a client is requesting you to do something, <clears throat> but there is no legal rule forcing you to do detailed testing. Okay, cool. Our first bit of technical revision done. And before we move into our first question, let's take a look at a second bit of technical revision on a totally different topic, an audit standard, which is audit standard 720 and called other information. Now this is an audit standard that has a link uh, with audit reports. So on an audit reporting question, this could be something you need to write about and explain, or possibly it could come up uh, as an explanation. So what are your duties as an auditor regarding other information? Or it could of course come up within the MCQs. The key here is to understand that shareholders, especially in big listed companies, don't just receive the financial statements. They receive something called the company's annual report. The financial statements comprise, of course, the statement of profit or loss, the statement of financial position, cash flow statement potentially if it's a listed company and the other main bit of interest to us on this course are the disclosure notes <coughs> explaining things like the accounting policies that have been used uh, the going concern assumption uh, any uncertainties relating to going concern contingent liabilities showing the movement on tangible non-current assets brought forward plus additions, minus disposals, etc., etc., etc. And these are, of course, subject to audit, <coughs> meaning we provide an audit opinion in the audit report. Fine. But the difficulty is that attached to those financial statements is loads of other stuff. Stuff like the chairman's statement, corporate governance reports. <coughs> social and environmental data. And who knows what else? And it is worth noting that some companies' annual reports have got 200, 300 pages 
before you even get to the accounts. These are not subject to audit. <coughs> However, the auditor must read it. So, the question here is, why? If we don't have to audit this stuff, why do we need to read it? Well, we're on revision now, not tuition, so if you are watching this live, why don't you tell me? Why do we need to read the company's annual report? What's the point? Any volunteers? <coughs> In case something controversial, good word. Uh, yeah, I think contradict is probably slightly safer than controversial. Uh, but you're both on the, on the right line, so that's great. There might be information which is inconsistent with the financial statements. And that would confuse the shareholders. And we have a duty to try to make sure that shareholders are not confused. <coughs> um, Actually, Lorraine, that's an interesting point uh, to get an understanding about the company. I think it is a fair point that reading companies' annual reports enhances your understanding. But this is right at the end of the audit. And if you're telling me you don't understand the company at this late stage, I think that's a bit late. Uh, if a potential new client comes to me, I'd read their last four or five years' annual reports to help me understand before I decide whether to audit them. But at this late stage, that's not the reason you're doing it. Uh, to make sure it follows corporate governance codes. Uh, not your job. It is not your job to check that they are following corporate governance codes. Uh, your job is to check their accounts are right. And that is it. <coughs> so, we will read the annual report to see if there's anything in there which seems to be different to what we've checked and know is true and fair in the accounts. And if you find an inconsistency and the client refuses to correct it, what do you do? Anyone remember? Shoot the client dead. Nope. I think that's a little unethical. Not allowed to do stuff like that. Okay, now one of the reasons I'm asking you questions is not just to test your knowledge. It's to see how you express your answers. <coughs> um, disclose or modify is rather vague. Disclose what, modify what. You've then said opinion. Uh, if you are telling me you want to change the opinion in the audit report, you are absolutely wrong. Madin, I'm afraid you are wrong as well. Can I just remind you, to help the understanding here, the audit opinion is on the financial statements. These are not the financial statements. You absolutely do not modify the audit opinion. Because the financial statements are absolutely fine. What you instead do is add an extra section to the audit report and Ashok is in there and has got it right. You add something called an other matter paragraph. 
Uh, that is not the same uh, sadiku as an emphasis of matter, which I think is what you were getting at. That is different. Uh, and yes, you point out the difference. So typically it will say something like, uh, in the third sentence of the chairman's statement, the chairman refers to the company having made a profit during the year. The financial statements report a loss for the year and our audit work uh, resulted in us forming an opinion that the financial statements were true and fair. Our opinion on the financial statements is not modified in this respect. So the accounts are fine, everybody. The chairman's talking rubbish, and it's in the third sentence of the chairman's statement. So you just point out where the mistake is, but tell everyone your audit opinion is not affected. OK, well, as you can see, audit report related items are probably technically a little bit more fiddly than other stuff on the course. That is one area you want to spend a bit of time and make sure you know the eight possible outcomes of which other matter paragraphs are one. OK, enough of such fun. Time for us to look at an area that has always come up as long questions in the past. We suspect it won't come up quite so frequently in the future but you may still get part of a long question that covers this, so we need to look at at least one of them. Uh, okay, right, well, since you've asked in between topics and it's quite convenient, so well done for that, fine, I will explain key audit matters. <coughs> <coughs> Why not? The first thing uh, I must make clear on this is CAMs are for listed companies only. So for companies listed on the stock exchange. Okay, let me put this in some context. I have been teaching auditing for 20 and a half years. Scary stuff. And for years and years, I have said the same thing to every class I have taught. Audit reports are boring. They would be much more useful if instead of saying, hello shareholders, we've checked the accounts, they're true and fair, bye. They'd be far more interesting if they said, hello shareholders, let me tell you all the mistakes that we thought might be in the accounts and the big arguments we had with the client before the set of accounts that you now see before you. And that sort of is what's happened with key audit matters. Someone has decided that audits would be far more useful if the auditors actually told the shareholders what things worried them in the accounts, what audit work they did to see if the accounts were right or not, and the conclusions they came to. And that's what key audit matters are. When we look at the first big core area, which is audit risk and response, what's audit risk? It's the risk that the financial statements are materially misstated and the audit testing fails to spot those mistakes, which is detection risk. Now, there's no need to say to the shareholders, um, uh, key audit matter, um, Actually, I'll take that, but forget what I was about to say. This could actually be quite useful. Uh, right, so at the start of an audit, we look at their accounts and we say, right, where might they make mistakes and why? Well, in the past, 
we identified those risks, designed some audit tests, did the tests, and never actually told anybody. We just got on with it. Now, for corporate governance purposes, we need to discuss all of this with the audit committee at the start of the audit to make sure they are happy with the audit we're going to do. We will also discuss our findings with the audit committee at the end of the audit. And it's been pointed out that if it's useful to discuss this with the audit committee, why not tell the shareholders as well? So we are going to describe the key risks of material misstatement. The tests or audit procedures, if you prefer that word, we did to respond to those risks. and the conclusions that we reached. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be every single risk of material misstatement, because if the list becomes too long, the danger is shareholders don't bother reading this stuff because there's too much detail. So we're looking for some edited highlights. And don't ask how many key audit matters should there be, or how do you decide what goes in. There's no right answers to those. It's up to the audit firms to decide. Uh, the conclusions that you reached should always be based on the tests we were happy that this had been accounted for properly because if you're going to conclude it hasn't been accounted for properly you'd be changing the audit opinion and if you're modifying the audit opinion there's no need to describe it again as a key audit matter because you've already described it. So the audit opinion will report on what's wrong in the accounts. The key audit matters will report on all the other big things you did during the audit and how you address them to get to a conclusion that they looked true and fair. To help the shareholders understand what the big issues are in the accounts and how your audit process dealt with them. Uh, so that's all they are, it's a description of the audit. Um, but it's worth noting that it's very much um, linked to what you do on this exam because it's the risks of material misstatement and your response to those risks. So it's likely to say things like, uh, the company has got very complicated inventory, very industry specific, and as a result of that, there is a risk that it's wrongly valued, wrongly identified, because it's quite difficult to deal with. Uh, I'd imagine the response you took to that risk was to get some specialist help on the audit team of people who understand the stuff to help you value it. So it'll be things like that. Um, good, glad you understand it. Uh, but if you want any more help on this, read the examiner's articles on it, because her articles are largely aimed at understanding key audit matters. All freely available on ACCA Global. Uh, and if they're not uh, there already, I'll stick them up on Canvas. I'm pretty sure I put them up there during the tuition phase, but let's put them on the revision bit as well. Okay, enough about audit reports. Glad it's helped, Ashok. Glad it's helped. Let us take a look at the ethics part of the course. <coughs> Now, the fundamentals of ethics are that there are five big concepts. PICO, as they're often referred to. Accountants must behave professionally, act with integrity, maintain client confidentiality in most cases carry out our work competently and with due care, and maintain our objectivity. <clears throat> now, I'm going to re uh, revise some of that with you. I'm certainly not going to revise all five, uh, because some of those are just one-line definitions, and you just need to go and learn them. For the exam, there tend to be three important areas. One more important than the other two.
The last one, objectivity, is the one that gets examined the most. And you may get a story and be asked to identify threats to objectivity and suggest safeguards <coughs> to manage those threats. Come back to that in a minute. Second one is about the confidentiality one on the list. You do need to be able to explain why we should maintain client confidentiality, but also the exceptions when we either must report something happening at our client or we might report something happening at our client. And then the third exam area that comes up from time to time is a bit of a combination of the objectivity and the confidentiality. And that is where you have a conflict of interest or interests between two clients. So what I'll do is I'll remember, sorry, remember, I'll revise uh, confidentiality and conflicts of interests because with those you just need to know them. And then we will look at a question for threats to objectivity and safeguards. Confidentiality, if we do that one first. Uh, what are the exceptions when we breach? Well, sometimes you must report your client uh, to the authorities of some sort, and sometimes you might. You must report them if you think they're involved in money laundering, terrorism, and any other really, really serious type of crime really serious. And then there are situations when you might report your client. And the most likely one of those for the exam is where you think it is in the best interests of society to do so. <clears throat> now, if you have to report your client, your hands are tied. Uh, there's nothing you can do about it. You just got to get on and report them. If it's a case of, hmm, you might, I suggest you take legal advice and get your lawyers to advise you. Uh, I suppose the most obvious example where you might want to report your client is where they are doing something that may be harming their customers, uh, the local population, but no one realises it. Well, if you don't tell them, no one finds out and then people might get injured, die. So if you think they're doing something which is dangerous for society, I suggest you might want to tell someone. Uh, what about conflicts of interests? The question here is, can you possibly audit two companies if those companies are somehow linked? Well, I would suggest there's two slightly different examples you might want to think about here. Can we audit two companies in the same industry? So the one I always say is Apple and Samsung, but equally, I don't know, Volkswagen and Mercedes-Benz, Barclays Bank and the Royal Bank of Scotland. Can we audit two companies who are competing in the same industry? Because on the one hand, good. If you understand one bank, you'll understand another bank. There's some natural efficiency here. But the danger with auditing two competitors is number one, anything you do to help one of those companies means you are hurting your other client because in an industry, it's a zero-sum game. If one company is winning, it must be at the expense of the others. 
and you're not allowed to harm your clients. And if you're helping one client and harming another, that's a problem. But the other problem is if you're auditing two companies in the same industry, I imagine that each of them would very much like to know what's going on at their competitor. And of course you know, don't you? Because you audit them. So confidentiality breaches are a major problem. But it's not just about auditing two companies in the same industry. Bear in mind, you could be auditing two companies, one of whom is, I don't know, um, a company that carries out electrical work for businesses. And the other company that you audit is a chain of hotels. No obvious link. And then unbeknown to you, the hotel group employs the electricity company to come and do electrical work in the hotels. And now they are suing the electrical company because they say they didn't do it very well and guests have been injured and blah, 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 blah. They're taking them to court. And the problem, of course, is you audit both companies. So whose friend are you going to be in this court case? So you're stuck in the middle. Uh, conflicts of interest are nice and easy to deal with because the solution is always the same. If you are going to deal with both clients, audit both of them. Don't have any member of staff auditing them both. If you're a big enough audit firm, preferably those two teams are from two separate offices. have extra confidentiality procedures. So tell the people who work on these two clients uh, that there is an ethical issue, meaning they must not, under any circumstances, discuss what happens at that client, even with colleagues in the office, because of course the colleagues in the office could be working on the other client. Uh, store the working papers of the audit in two separate locations. Two separate servers, if you're doing this IT-wise. And you must make sure both clients know that you audit the other one and the procedures you're putting in place to manage the situation. That way it gives them the opportunity to say, OK, thank you for telling us, we like your safeguards. Or alternatively to say, well, thank you for telling us, uh, now we realise this, uh, we're going to ask you not to be our auditors anymore and we're going to find someone else. You've got to be open and honest about this. Of course, if you don't think that those safeguards, those procedures up there are enough, well, don't audit them both then. Resign from one or maybe even both of them. Okay. Well, that's enough knowledge. It's time to get towards some actual writing of sentences. Let's have a look in the first column above me there. Threats to objectivity and safeguards to manage those threats. Now we are heading closer and closer to the exam. I rather hope that when I write those six letters up there, you have some idea what they mean in the context of threats to objectivity. I could, of course, at this point, fill them all in for you. But if I do that, all it proves is that I know them. It doesn't prove that you know them. So the longer I leave them sitting up there without filling them in, the longer you get to stare at them and see if you can remember what they all are. But as with everything on this paper, simply knowing what those six things are is nowhere near enough. You need to understand what each of them means and be able to explain them, and therefore be able to identify each type of threat within a story. So let's go with the easy bits first. There's the first two types of threat. Great, we know the words. What do they actually mean? Self-interest means that there is a situation 
where the auditor might ignore mistakes in a client's accounts and not report them to shareholders because it's in the auditor's best interests to do that. So that is the threat. You give the wrong opinion on the accounts for your own personal benefit. Now, typically when we say personal benefit, it's probably got dollar signs attached to it. It's money. Self-review threat, what does that mean? Checking your own work. Yes, yes, I know that, but who cares? Well, if you check your own work, number one, you're less likely to spot your own mistakes. And number two, if you do spot that you made a mistake doing something else for the client, you have an obvious interest in keeping that quiet. Meaning you don't report mistakes in the accounts or you don't find mistakes in the accounts because you are checking your own work. Now notice both explanations for self-interest and self-review are both saying you give the wrong audit opinion. Because that's what all this ethics stuff is about, trying to protect the audit opinion to make sure you give the right opinion and the shareholders trust it. Any threat to either of those two things, the correctness of your opinion or the shareholders' confidence in your opinion, are threats. And we need to manage those. Okay, now you get the basic idea. Let's remind you of the other four. And with all of them, keep going back to the idea of how could these threaten either the accuracy of your audit opinion or the shareholders trust in it. So intimidation is where you ignore mistakes in the accounts and give the wrong audit opinion because the client is putting pressure on you to do so. Familiarity is where you ignore mistakes in the accounts and give the wrong audit opinion or you trust the work that's been done by someone too much and therefore don't test it enough and therefore miss mistakes in the accounts and give the wrong audit opinion because you are too friendly with the people at the client. And there are all sorts of reasons why that might be the case. Advocacy is where you do something for the client which makes shareholders think that you are on the client's side. Advocacy is not so much about you giving the wrong audit opinion, it's the worry that because you're seen as on the client's side, shareholders think you've given the wrong audit opinion. And the management threat is where you as auditor are doing tasks for a client that normally the directors or management of the company would be doing Meaning to the outside eye of a shareholder, you are looking like you're the same as the directors. And the whole point of the external auditor is we keep a distance, a separation from the thing we're auditing. Okay, so those are the threats. Uh, the best thing we can do now is go take a look at our first question. And we are going to look at... June 2015 and question number one. So in the last couple of years, uh, it has frequently been the case that the first question, which was a 10 marker before we had the new format that kicked in in September, uh, typically a 10 marker of ethics, threats and safeguards. Now we have a new format from the last sitting in September with three long questions, not six but there's nothing to stop the first 10 marks in a 20 or 30 marker being one of these, so no reason why not. Okay, let's go take a look. Uh, June 15. So there we go, there is the exam paper from last summer. There's lots of nice multiple choice questions. Just a reminder, uh, they're not in this format anymore. Now, there are five questions, all with the same scenario behind them. But there's no reason not to practice these, my friends. 
No reason not to practice these at all. They're a very good way of checking your knowledge. But we're not doing that at the moment. Okay, so it's the beginning of the F8 exam. You've just turned over the question paper. My view is you go straight to the long questions, not the multiple choice. Don't read the stories yet. You go to the requirements only and you say, right, what type of question is this? Identify and explain. You're going to explain everything, aren't you? Because I told you to. Five ethical threats. So I'm thinking there'll be types of those. And remind myself, I must say why. Uh, in answer to your question, Lorraine, absolutely zero chance of them being published. Uh, the ACCA's new policy for the last year, now they're on four sittings a year, they're not going to publish all four exam papers. Every six months, they are going to take some of the questions from the September paper and some from December, only half from each, mix them up, and they're going to publish that. So we get to see half the questions overall and none of the multiple choice questions anymore. Yes, I have complained to the ACCA a lot. Uh, I think their main logic for doing this is they want to save some questions that us tutors never see so that as they move towards computerized exams, they can have a nice big batch of old questions that they can then set again because we've never seen them. But no, you're not going to see any September questions yet. Uh, around about January, when the results come out for December, they'll publish a joint December-September paper, just as they did last year. Uh, of course, we do have a reasonable idea of what came up in September, because all you've got to do is read the student forums uh, the day after the exam, and read the examiner's report, which they are still writing for each sitting, which is on the ACCA's website and then you get a pretty good idea of what came up. Uh, I don't have it with me right here, at least I don't think I do, no. Uh, but in the second class, I will tell you, based on my research, what has come up on the last few sittings, because of course you can't tell. Okay, so we need five ethical threats. Now at the moment, all it says is ethical. Well, that's five concepts. Professional behaviour, integrity, it's PICO. So I need to keep reading, which may affect the independence. Your examiner uses the words objectivity and independence interchangeably. So this is definitely about SAFIM. For each threat, explain how it might be reduced to an acceptable level. And that means safeguards. 10 marks available. Uh, I normally find that if you can find the threats and explain them, the safeguards are normally pretty obvious. Also, because ethical threats are one of the easier technical things on the course, if she wants you to find five, the story probably only has five or maybe six. She won't give you 25 to choose from. Just while we're on that subject, uh, if she asks you for five of something, the markers will be told, mark everything that the student writes. If the student writes six threats and safeguards, we mark all six and you get your best five. Now, I think that's a dangerous rule to have because it encourages students to do more than five and you don't have the time. So my advice is go and find what you can find Pick the five you're most comfortable explaining and write those. If at the end you've got a spare minute or two, maybe throw a sixth one in for safety. But I'd just go for five if I were you. So, threats and reducing them. Uh, if this were to come up, I think a two column approach would make a lot of sense. And since this is the first question we're going to do on revision, I will actually write out the answer for you. Isn't that nice of me? 
First thing though, we need to go through the story and see what we can find. Okay, you are an audit senior beach and have been allocated to the audit of Willow Wands, a listed company. Now that might prove to be important because listed companies tend to have tighter ethics rules. So whereas for most audits, it tends to be, you probably shouldn't do this, but as long as you've got some safeguards, I suppose it's okay. With listed companies, there are a few extra things that are no. For example, uh, you cannot prepare the accounts and audit them. If it's not listed, as long as you use two separate teams of staff, in theory, you could. Okay. It's been an audit client for eight years and specializes in manufacturing musical instruments. Well, if we've been auditing this company for eight years, which by the way is totally allowable as a firm, there must be a risk that some members of the audit team, if they've been on that audit for all eight years, are going to be a bit too close for the client. So I think that is potentially one of the things I might want to talk about. Beth and Oak was the audit engagement partner for Willow, and as she had completed seven years as the audit engagement partner, she has recently been rotated off the audit engagement. Oh, well that's rather blown my plan out of the water. I was going to talk about the risk of staff doing more than seven years, and not only have they found it, the audit firm has already dealt with it. Boo! The current audit partner, Sandeep Pine, has suggested that in order to maintain a close relationship with Willow, Bethan should undertake the role of independent review partner this year. Right, forget about that then. If you've just taken Bethan off the audit because she's not independent, how can you then have her as the independent review partner? If you take her off, she should be off. So that's the first one. Uh, in addition, Willow has requested that Bethan assist them by attending their audit committee meetings. Hmm. I've never seen that come up in a question before, which makes that point a bit harder. But clearly that's got to be an issue we're meant to be talking about, otherwise why put it in the story? Willow has also asked Sandeep and the other partners at Beach to help them in recruiting a new non-executive director. I guess that's the third thing we're meant to talk about, but also not necessarily that easy. Hope this next paragraph's a bit easier. The total fees received by Beach for last year equated to 16% of the total income of the firm. That will be point number four. Uh, do you notice here, how long had, uh, has this audit been going on? Eight years, which is one more than seven. Seven being the rule, which is why Bethan has been rotated off. Why are the fees 16%? because the rule is 15%, isn't it? Your examiner is nice and neat with this. If there's a rule, she'll deliberately go slightly over or slightly under to help highlight where the rule is. Current year's audit fee has not yet been confirmed, but along with taxation and other possible non-audit fees, the total income from Willow this year could be greater than for last year. So it was 16% uh, last year and it looks like it could get worse. Clearly a problem. Now, you might not spot this one quite as obviously. We're not just auditing their accounts, we're doing some other things. And when you do other things, that can create threats as well. Last year's audit fee was being paid monthly by Willow, but no payments have been made for the last three months. Ooh, we've got outstanding fees. So I reckon we've got at least six points already. We only need five, so we can drop something complicated. But there's more. The audit manager for Willow 
has just announced he's leaving Beach & Co to join Willow as the financial controller. So the examiner has been reasonably generous here. I reckon we've got about seven possible points. Let's go for the easiest ones first. Uh, I think number one's pretty easy. You've taken someone off the audit because they're not independent and now you want to put them back on again as the independent review partner. Just before we go to the answer, what is an independent review partner? Well, the idea is that with listed company audits and any other audit which you think is really important or you think there's a big risk it might go wrong, when the audit team has finished their work and the engagement partner who will sign the audit report has reviewed everything, they call a second partner in, hand them all the audit files and say, have a look through that and tell me if you think it all looks okay. That's the independent review partner. And it's helpful if you know that in what you're about to explain in your answer. I think it always helps the marker if you can put a little heading in to say what you're about to talk about. Threat. If Bethan does the review, there is a familiarity threat to her independence as she was on audit team for seven years. Why do we say a familiarity threat? Well, familiarity is where you're too close to things, meaning either you've got an incentive not to raise things, to protect those you're close to, or you don't check things in enough detail because you think you know them well enough. And I think it's the second argument here. Because she knows this client, when she's going through the audit files, I think there are things in there that she won't bother questioning because she assumes they're okay. Now, what I've just explained there is called having a lack of professional skepticism. You get too close to something and you stop questioning it because you just assume it is right. Now, I think the familiarity point is fairly easy and a lot of students will get an easy half mark there. I think the explanation actually needs a bit of thought and is far more complicated. Which is why if you understand this stuff, it does make picking up the marks a lot easier. Uh, I said aim for at least two to three lines per mark. Uh, I've written, what, about seven or eight lines there, but I'm writing on slightly less than half the page. Uh, if I wrote all that across, it'd be about four lines. That's about right. Aim for that. Right, what do we do about this? Pretty straightforward mark coming up because we are going to say Bethan must not be involved in this audit client at all this year. Now, if you wanted to be a bit cleverer, you could say, or for next year, she should be off the audit for at least two years to reduce her familiarity with the client but that is not needed to get the whole mark, trust me. If you're gonna say something shouldn't happen, it would be helpful if you said the alternative. So a different partner with no links 
to this client. Should do the independent review. And there you have it, folks. The first two marks are in the bank. Um, I've often thought with ethical questions that it's a lot easier to get the mark in the right-hand column all the way over there than it is to get the mark in the left-hand column. Uh, if you can spot what the issue is, even if you can't explain it that well, uh, explaining how to deal with it, I think, is relatively easy. Okay, well, there's the first one. What else do I think is fairly easy? Fees. If your boss at work tells you to do something, chances are you'll do it. Even if your boss doesn't tell you to do something, if you think there's something you can do to make your boss's life much easier, there's a chance you'll do it voluntarily. Because you get 100% of your income from your job and you dare not lose it, because you need the money. Auditors don't have one boss. They have lots of clients. But if you've got one client that pays a substantial amount of your fees, it's the same problem, isn't it? The client may push you around, or you may voluntarily do things which are probably not very ethical, to keep that client happy and keep the money rolling in. And with audit fees, 15% is deemed to be the point above which we have a problem. Of course, you're only gonna do nice things in order to earn money in the future. So if you're earning a lot of money this year, but it's due to go down next year, less incentive. The issue is if you're above 15% for at least this year and next year, that's where we've got the problem. So if fees from one client are greater than 15% for at least two consecutive years, self-interest and intimidation threats arise. A lot of students will stop writing at that point and get half a mark. Explain why. We might ignore financial statement errors to keep this big client happy, especially if they pressure us. Okay, wunderbar. What do you do about it? Well, the answer is you need to get those fees to fall because if they're not falling as a percentage of your total fees in your firm, this cannot continue. Now, some students will say, go and win extra clients, because the more clients you've got, the smaller this percentage will be. Well, mathematically correct, that works, very well done. But if it was that easy to go and win lots of new clients, wouldn't you have done it anyway? And you're not going to win new clients by the end of the afternoon, are you? That is a longer term solution. It is not going to help right now. So probably the best solution is to say, is it possible to do less work for this client so we rely on them less for fees? Well, you are doing audit, tax and some other stuff. So the best advice I would say is discuss with client reducing the services we provide, e.g. stop taxation work, to help reduce ongoing fees below the 15% threshold. 
And there you have it. Two down. Four marks in the bag. Now both of those are pretty straightforward ones. Let's go back and see what else. I think the audit committee one's quite hard. Help them recruiting a non-executive quite hard. We've done the fees. Uh, no payments in the last three months. How about that one? Outstanding fees also create self-interest or intimidation threats. Uh, oh, Ashok, interesting question that you asked there. Uh, the key here, is the partner who is signing this audit report financially gaining from the fees? Now, if your audit firm is organised in such a way that other countries share their money only between themselves and they're not sharing with you, getting another office from another country or region to do some work for a client might get you around this problem. Good point. Uh, I think it would be a little bit odd to hand over UK tax affairs to German auditors and accountants. So I think if you wanted to suggest that, you'd need to be a little bit careful. Um, but yeah, in theory, you could get around it that way. Uh, interesting and a good point. Right, outstanding fees. These create a self-interest threat. Could argue intimidation as well, but time is limited in the exam and one threat is enough. Always explain why. Because we might ignore financial statement errors to avoid upsetting client as this might make them pay even slower. Uh, with outstanding fees, uh, the solution's pretty obvious. Ask client to settle overdue fees before any other work begins on this client. Because if they've paid, there's no incentive anymore, is there? Now I've picked three of the easier ethical threats in that story. There are obviously more. And the reason I picked the easier ones first is I've just scored six out of 10 and I have passed. Don't deal with them in the order in the story. Deal with them in the order you're most comfortable with. Pass it at least first. And then when you're having a go at the harder ones, you can relax a bit thinking, well, I've already passed, so let's give it a go with a smile on my face. And it reduces the pressure a bit. Okay, well, we've still got a few other ones to do, uh, but I did say we ought to take a break at some point, and we've been going for an hour and a half, which is a pretty long run. So let's have 15 minutes at that point. When we come back, we'll finish off that question, and then we're gonna move on to the first big core area, which is planning and audit risk and response. I will see you in approximately 15 minutes.
Okay, everybody, back I am. So we're looking at explaining ethical threats and safeguards. We're looking at June 15, question number one. We identified about seven different threats in there. And so far, I've explained three of them. We only need five. Three gets me a pass. What else have we got in this question? Well, I've dealt with number one. I've dealt with number four. And I have dealt with number six. I'm thinking number seven is looking fairly easy now. The audit manager for Willow has just announced he is leaving Beach & Co to join Willow as the financial controller. Now watch out with this example, because in a question you could quite easily have someone going from client to audit firm, or as in this case, going from audit firm to client. And the explanation is going to be different in each case. So the audit manager is about to go join the audit client. Now, if he was going to join the audit client and run their canteen or sweep the floors, it wouldn't be such an issue because he'd have no involvement in the financial statements. But if he's going as financial controller, clearly he will have. Now, there's two separate things here. Is there an issue with him because he hasn't left yet and is there an issue with anybody else? Let's deal with him first of all. Well, he still works for our audit firm and at present he has a clear self-interest threat and now explain it. Now at this point I'm tempted to go back and take a little look at what the question says. He's announced that he is leaving. Well, generally people can't just leave, they have to work a notice period, so he's gonna be around for a little bit longer. And from what the story seems to suggest, there's no dates in here at all, no year ends. But if they're still deciding who should do the partner review at the end, I'd imagine this audit hasn't started yet. So presumably he's had no involvement on the client since announcing that he was going to leave. But you don't get jobs overnight. You have to go through a recruitment process. And so I'm a little bit concerned that he might have ignored financial statement errors in the past or might do so going forward to help get the job offer. And now he's got it, of course, to avoid any risk of losing it. But that's not the only risk. If he goes and joins this client tomorrow, which he probably won't, because as I said, notice periods and all that, but if he was to go and join the client tomorrow, when our audit staff go and do the audit, they'd be auditing their friend. So it might also be worth mentioning that in the future, existing audit staff will have a familiarity threat as they might trust their ex-colleague too much and not test his work fully. 
Or I suppose, if they did find mistakes, if they're still friendly with their ex-colleague, they might decide to keep those mistakes quiet. So there's actually more than one threat in this particular part of the story. Well, if his recruitment by that company went on for a while, and if he has done recent work on the client, I think we need to review any recent work he has done on this client. to see if it might have been affected by the job offer. To stop any problems going forward, remove him from this client's work immediately. And that will help to avoid future problems. We might also want to take a look at his contract because typically in firms of accountants, they don't want people like managers and partners going and working at clients because of all these problems they create. And it might be against his contractual terms. And if we do let him go and join this client in the future, well, if all the staff at your office know this guy too well, we might need to get another office of our firm to audit this client once the manager joins them. Now, just to be clear, uh, I have written there about three separate threats and given you plenty of potential safeguards. You don't need all of them. I'm just pointing out that when someone goes from audit firm to client, it actually creates all sorts of fun and games and therefore you could potentially get at least a couple of different threats and solutions out of that point. Now, I can't write every answer out in full as we go through revision, otherwise we don't get enough questions done. I think you've got the point now. Everything I've written, I've tried to say this because of this. Explain everything. I've aimed for two to three lines at least of everything I write. Bit of detail, please. So for the final few points, I'll go for an answer plan. And what are the other points? Well, we do other services for the client, e.g. tax. Well, tax is in the financial statements, so that would create self-review threat. Uh, I'd also be tempted to say that if you are helping a client with tax, it could be seen as advocacy because you are helping them, presumably, to pay as little tax as possible, so you may well be seen as on their side. So doing additional services is dangerous. Uh, you are typically allowed to do them but there is an ever-growing list of things that you probably shouldn't do, and tax is one of those areas, especially for listed clients, where it's probably best not to do it. And that, of course, would help solve the 16% fees issue as well, so you would kill two threats with one action. And what else did we have? Sit on the client's audit committee. Well, what do we know about audit committees from corporate governance? They're meant to have at least one person with recent audit and financial reporting experience, and as an audit partner, 
you'd certainly tick that box, wouldn't you? However, they're meant to be independent non-executives. And what does an audit committee do? It oversees internal control systems, financial reporting, and of course the audit process. Which means if one of our audit partners is sitting on the client's audit committee, we've got a clear self-interest or self-review threat. Remember the audit committee also suggests which audit firm should be nominated to the shareholders and should it do other services. Well, if we're putting someone on the audit committee, surely we're going to say, keep our own firm as auditors. We're great. Don't bother checking the work we're doing. Trust me, we're wonderful. And give us as much other work as possible. That's not independent, is it? Uh, so the answer to sitting on the audit committee is no. Not in a million years. And they also want us to help recruit a new non-executive. Well, who normally recruits directors? That should be the nominations committee. Bit of corporate governance knowledge again. Which should ideally be made up of independent NEDs. You see, the problem is, if we help them recruit a new non-executive, we again have a self-interest threat to help them recruit someone who's going to be friendly to our firm going forward. You could also suggest uh, we might try and push them into recruiting the most expensive candidate possible because typically you get paid a percentage of the salary of the person you help recruit. So for all sorts of reasons this causes a problem. There's also here a management threat that we are seen as doing the director's work for them. Which means to an outsider they start to question is there really a difference between the directors and the auditors? I guess sitting on the audit committee could help create a similar problem. We are not allowed to make decisions for clients. We can help. So we need to avoid making a decision for them. I think we can help them. We might suggest uh, interview questions. We might suggest qualities to look out for on the CVs, the resumes of the people applying for it. But we must not make the final decision. So if they said, can you have a look at the following CVs and let me know what you think, I'd probably say yes as long as you cross out the names, birth dates uh, of the people her, whose CVs they are, just in case we see someone who we have a connection with. Help, yes, decide not. And there you have it, a typical ethical threats and safeguards type of question. Now, I reckon that going forward, I reckon going forward, we're not going to get quite as many of that type of question in the long questions because that could easily be a scenario from which five ethics type MCQs and maybe some corporate governance could come. You could easily see how that could turn into a, a five multiple choice question case, couldn't you? So we're just going to do one of those and move on to the first big core area next. But before we do that, crikey. Good sign this, people. We've got so many questions. I actually need to scroll the screen down. Uh, is shortlisting candidates also a threat? Um, yes, because you're deciding who shouldn't be considered. Uh, don't do anything with names involved. 
Suggest some criteria to shortlist candidates, but don't actually do it yourself. Okay, that is fabulous. Enough though of that. It is time that we moved on and looked at the first of the big three. Now, we're not gonna do all of it tonight, but we're gonna start looking at the first of the three big core areas and we'll finish off uh, on Monday night in class number two. Virtually guaranteed to be in the long questions on every paper going forward. There will be a scenario there might be some numbers in it. Uh, we won't be dealing with the numbers tonight. We'll deal with them on Monday. And your job will, rather like the last question type we looked at, be to find five or maybe six or maybe seven. It's always been five, six or seven. Audit risks from the story and then explain them and explain what the audit team should do about them, how it should respond. In order to have a go at one of these questions, there is a bit of knowledge we need. There is an audit risk model. Only explain the model in your answer if the question says explain the audit risk model. If the question says here's a story, what are the risks? Just get straight into the story. But you might be asked to explain the model and if you understand the model, it helps in explaining the risks. So a reminder, the audit risk is the risk of giving the wrong opinion. In other words, the risk of the financial statements are materially misstated and audit tests fail to identify these mistakes, meaning you would say the accounts are true and fair when in fact they are not. <clears throat> Why on earth might a client make mistakes in their accounts? Two reasons. Inherent risk is the risk of there being mistakes in a company's accounts simply because of the nature of the company, what it does, the industry it's in, how complicated it is, uh, its economic situation, can all lead to mistakes. The problem with inherent risk is it's inherent, it's the nature of the company, there's nothing you can do about it, those risks are simply always going to be there. But companies put in place things called internal controls to manage their risks. So another part of the risk of accounts being wrong is how good are the controls over the financial reporting that the company has put in place. So that is control risk, the nature of their control systems. And then this one, of course, is called detection risk. Uh, I doubt this will earn you many, if any, marks on the exam, but just a reminder, there are two reasons that audit testing fails to spot mistakes. One is an unrepresentative sample, because of course we don't test everything, we pick a sample. If the sample is not representative of the population from which it's drawn, your sample will tell you one thing, which if you tested the population, would have told you something different. And the second reason is inexperienced audit staff. Because even if you've picked the right items to test, if you've sent audit staff who don't have the experience, knowledge, competence to audit this type of client, they'll make mistakes. 
So how do audit firms deal with this? Number one, you assess the client's inherent risks. Number two, we assess and of course test the controls to stop the inherent risks. causing financial statement errors. And then based on how well the controls operate, we adjust the level of substantive testing that we do. So if one and two combined are high, then we need to lower detection risk. And if you're worried about unrepresentative samples, pick bigger samples, because the more things you test, the closer you are to testing the population. So increase our substantive testing. Or if you're worried about inexperienced audit staff, staff even, send better audit staff to the client. So that is the audit risk model, which you might be asked to explain. The key point here is if you understand audit risk, explaining audit risks should be a lot easier. Because now we've been reminded about audit risk, there are only two types, the risk the accounts are materially misstated, or the risk that audit tests fail to identify these mistakes. So when we are explaining audit risks, we either need to explain why the financial statements might be materially misstated. And remember that could be the nature of the company or it could be weak controls. or why audit tests might find it hard to spot those errors. So that's what you've got to focus on. For the exam questions, That is by far the biggest area for getting you marks. And if you are going to explain why the financial statements might be materially misstated, you need to tell me which financial statement items you think are at risk. Do you think they're at risk of being overstated? or understated. If you're not sure, say either, but try to be specific if at all possible. You need to explain why, and typically, that means quoting some accounting rules as you do so, which of course means if you don't know the accounting rules, that bit's going to be a bit tricky. And if there are any numbers in the question, calculate materiality. You are, after all, meant to be describing the risk of material misstatement, not just misstatement. But you can only do that if figures are present. And that is basically all you need to know to be able to do these questions. So the next thing we need to do is have a go at one of these questions. And we are going to do another question from that June 2015 paper. This time we are going to do question number five.
Okay, let's go see what it says. Now you can see that with the bigger questions, uh, this one's a 20 marker, with the bigger questions, you don't just get the big practical exercise, which is there in the middle, six audit risks, response to each risk, and you can see the majority of the 20 marks, 12 out of 20 are for this bit. She also uses smaller amounts of marks to help test some of the knowledge and understanding on the course by making you explain it in your own words. Part C, we don't need to do, uh, because I've already explained it to you tonight. So review, that was all about providing limited assurance, how these differ from external audits, reasonable assurance, higher level. Uh, describe the level of assurance provided by external and review, for the four marks in part C, if you basically repeat everything I showed you earlier tonight, you'll easily score four out of four. There's also a part A to this question. Uh, state Maples and Co's responsibilities in relation to the prevention and detection of fraud and error. We'll do that at the end, because that's just pure knowledge revision. Good chance to uh, test your knowledge of an audit standard. Let's focus on the big practical marks, the 12 marks in the middle, as we were just going through. So rather like our first question, two column answer, audit risks and responses to those risks. Okay, now I focus very heavily on the audit risks because to me, if you can spot them and explain them, the responses are generally a little easier. But what do we mean by responses to risk? We mean what do auditors do when they spot one? And there are various things that auditors tend to do. Of course, a lot of the things auditors do are audit tests, procedures. So maybe that will form the backbone of the answer. But sometimes we respond to risks by having to put specialist staff on the audit. Sometimes our response will be the timing of the audit work we do. Sometimes the response will be to increase our substantive procedures because we think internal controls are weak. Sometimes if our trust in the client is coming down, our response to a risk is to tell our staff to increase their professional Scepticism, which generally means getting less evidence from inside the client and changing the nature of our audit procedures to try and collect more from external sources. But I don't know what the responses will be. It's a bit like the ethics. There's no point me going through safeguards before you do a question. The safeguards will depend on the ethical problems you spot. And likewise here, the responses will depend on the risks. Another question type where we're looking for six, I bet you there's a lot more than six, so I'm going to take you through the story, explain the issues verbally as I find them, and then we'll start mapping them into the answer. Again, trying to take the easier ones first. Right, so we're looking for six risks. Uh, my advice with these questions is you can probably forget detection risk and just look for six numbers in this company's accounts that you think are at risk of being wrong and why. You are the audit supervisor of Maple, currently planning the audit of an existing client, Sycamore Science, whose year end was the 30th of April 2015. Ooh. Now that's rare because normally we do most of our planning work before the year end. This exam was June 15. The year end was one month ago. Sycamore is a pharmaceuticals company which manufactures and supplies a wide, a wide range of medical supplies. 
Revenue 35.6, PBT 5.9, those numbers are there to help us calculate materiality, should we need to. Sycamore's previous finance director left the company in December 14. So that was during the accounting year, four months before the year end. After it was discovered, he had been claiming fraudulent expenses from the company for a significant period of time, which suggests that some of the numbers in expenses in the accounts might not be expenses. That's a risk. A new finance director was appointed in January 15. Now that means that person is new, maybe lacks total understanding of the company. Previously a financial controller of a bank. Well bank and pharmaceuticals are going to have different accounting issues. I'm now worried of mistakes in the accounts because the finance director lacks pharmaceuticals experience and by the way Looks like they've not been a finance director before. Financial controller before, lower level. And she has expressed surprise that Maple & Co had not uncovered the fraud during last year's audit. Now that final point is getting at what are Maple's responsibilities regarding fraud. So that's to do with part A of the question. Rather like the previous question we did, the first two problems I've found are maybe not quite as obvious and not things I've seen in quite so many past exam questions. And this is one of the reasons my view is read the whole thing and see what you can find and pick out easier ones because she might throw some nasties at you first. During the year, Sycamore has spent 1.8 million on developing several new products. Ah, this is a classic. These projects are at different uh, stages of development and the draft financial statement show the full amount of 1.8 million within intangible assets. Now that one is so straightforward, it's definitely going in my answer and I'm not going to read the rest of the story. That one's going in now. I have seen that come up in so many past exam questions on risk and response and so should you have done. <coughs> okay. So what's the risk? We need to say which items in the accounts are at risk of being wrong. Well, if this has been capitalized as intangible assets, then intangible assets are at risk of being wrong. They've capitalized the whole 1.8 million. So it can't be understated, can it? The risk is they've capitalized too much. So state which items. Well, if they shouldn't have gone to intangible assets, where would these costs have gone? And the answer is written off as expenses. So I could also say expenses understated. So I've picked the items in the accounts. I've said over or under. I now need to explain why quoting relevant accounting rules as far as I am able. Because IAS 38, and you don't need to know the numbers, but you know what? It's a lot quicker to write IAS 38 than it is to say the accounting standard that deals with development costs, so knowing the numbers helps, because IAS 38 requires dev costs to be capitalized only if projects likely to finish and items likely 
to sell. Notice I've already written quite a few words and I've not finished yet. It says the projects are at different stages, which means some of them will be relatively early in the project's timescale. And if you've ever tried completing a project, when you're near the end, you'll probably finish. When you're near the beginning, there's still a bit of doubt, isn't there? Those in early stages have greater risk of failure. So there we have a risk. Audit risks can often take uh, quite a lot of effort to explain. Now, he's jumped in ahead of me, so congratulations, because you're right. A second risk you could put in here is to say that some of those development costs might actually be research, and research should definitely be in expenses. A second reason why it might be overstated. So there are, in fact, two separate risks in here with two separate responses. Uh, and yes, you can therefore pick up four marks just from this. But I also said if there are numbers, calculate materiality. In the question, it tells us that revenue is 35.6 and PBT is 5.9. You don't have to do every calculation, but if you're not sure, why not? They're nice and quick. And there's no negative marking, so if you do a calculation that's really stupid calculation, all you've done is waste about 20 seconds. And I've also forgotten the numbers already. Oh dear. Uh, 35.6, 5.9. 35.6, 5.9. Oh dear. 35.6 and 5.9. So, oh dear. So, the dev costs are one point eight, one point eight, five percent, 1.8, 5.5, 30.5. Now, typically in these questions, there are some limited marks available for calculating materiality, which means scarily, if I can put two responses in for these two risks, that's four marks, I've almost certainly get a mark for the materiality five, I'm almost halfway to 12. <coughs> okay, responses. So I'm worried that at the year end, they've capitalized research and development costs, sorry, development costs, for projects that might never finish or items which might never sell. Well, the year end was the 30th of April. It's already one month later. By the time we do the audit responses, it will be even later. So why don't we say for all existing dev projects at the year end, check post year end progress to see if on track to finish. 
and maybe check market research to verify products expected to sell. <clears throat> to a certain extent, that second response, I mean, would a company really be spending a fortune developing something if they already know no one's going to buy it? Would seem a little unlikely, but worth checking. Uh, the second risk, some of those costs might be research. Fair point. Uh, well, we need to find out what the costs are, so get a breakdown of these 1.8 million costs. Inspect invoices to see if research by nature. In other words, check them out, see what this stuff is. Uh, you'll notice I never say the word check. Check's a very dangerous word. Uh, some students will just say in their answer, check these costs. Check them for what and check how. The word check is very dangerous. The word review is very dangerous. Review the costs. Notice I've actually put some words in my answer to make sure it makes sense. So that one comes up so often, I would just rock that one straight into the answer. So number three, I've dealt with. I'm looking for six of these, don't forget. It then says, in order to fund this development, two million was borrowed from the bank and is due for repayment over a 10 year period. They've got a new loan. And loans create risks that the accounts are wrong. Why is that? Oh dear. Number one, loans have this annoying thing called interest to pay. So, accruals and finance costs, name the items in the financial statements, will be understated if company has failed to accrue for interest up to the year end. Now that is especially a risk in the year that loans are taken out because often you've not made any payments yet and you forget to accrue. During the next year, some payments will be made. So that sort of prompts you into doing something about it. I like that risk because it's very quick to explain and the response is very quick as well because you get the loan agreement verify the date of the loan and the interest rate and then recalculate a prorated i.e. for the time since the loan up till the year end, interest charge, and inspect financial statements to verify accrued. Or something along those lines. But that's not the only reason I love loans because I also noticed that this loan is repayable over a 10 year period, so presumably in chunks. That means that possibly the first repayment will be one year after they took out the loan, which will therefore be in next accounting year and therefore repayable in less than one year, whereas the rest of the loan is repayable in more than one year. And that gives us a chance to start thinking about assertions. The loan liability might be, now this is interesting because this is not under or overstated, it's in the wrong place, wrongly classified. Part of loan 
might be repayable in less than one year. How do we respond to that? Well, find out the repayment schedule. Inspect, loan, agreement. To find repayment dates inspect financial statements to verify any repayments in the next accounting year are in liabilities less than one year. <clears throat> but the great thing about loans is they keep on giving. There's another risk as well. Now, I'm about to mention two words that you don't want to hear. Financial instruments. <laughs> don't panic. Relax. We're not talking futures, options and nasty things. We're talking a bank loan. Chill. But bank loans are an instrument for raising finance. And all financial instruments have an accounting standard called IFRS 7, which says there's a lot of stuff to disclose in the financial statements. You don't need to know what it is. But there is a risk that the IFRS 7 disclosures are incomplete, because there are so many of them, in the financial statement Disclosure notes. <clears throat> now I look at that point I have just written and I think, ooh, it's getting a bit short. If I wrote that straight across the page, that's less than two lines. So I'm going to try and add a little detail. This is good exam technique. Seeing that there's a risk you're short of a whole mark here. Uh, e, oh dear. Why do I keep changing the colour of the ink? E.g. Uh, any security on the loan? Any covenants? Uh, repayment dates? If you really want to get clever, the effect on the company's risk profile Anyway, that's enough of that IFRS 7. Uh, response. How do you know they've disclosed everything that IFRS 7 requires? Easy. Get a list of everything that IFRS 7 requires and tick it off in the disclosure notes. And compare to an IFRS 7 Disclosures checklist. Checklists are the normal way that we check disclosures because it's just like a shopping list of information for the shareholders. Um, there's not really much assessment required in it. It's just check. Have they done everything they should have done? That's all. How are we going? <clears throat> We've got one risk, two risks, three risks, four risks, five risks. Uh, I've got 10 marks worth of risk and response and a mark for materiality. I'm already almost there. Just going for the easier ones. So we've done three, we've done four. <clears throat> the bank has attached minimum profit targets as part of the loan covenants. Another classic. Straight in the answer it goes. Now you need to know what a covenant is to understand this. A covenant will say if the company's profit falls below this figure, the bank has the right to demand immediate repayment. Risk. Oh dear. Must remember to check the ink colour. Management has incentive to overstate revenues and understate expenses to keep profit above 
minimum covenant level to avoid early loan repayment. And as I said earlier on, if you are ever concerned that management might cheat in the accounts, the response was, tell your audit staff to increase or maintain their professional skepticism, e.g. avoid management representations and aim for more third party evidence. <clears throat> well, I'm feeling pretty confident uh, that I have got myself 12 out of 12 at that point. Uh, a question, could the covenant imply a going concern threat? Uh, only if when we read the rest of the story, profits are dangerously close to whatever minimum figure that is. And it looks like the company would struggle to pay that money back if it had to. Now, the reason I probably won't be putting it in the answer is I don't think the question said what the minimum profit level is. And if I don't know, there's no way of knowing if they're close to it. They might be miles above it, in which case, not a problem. <clears throat> so simply having a loan with a covenant does not create going concern threats unless their performance is close to it. Right, dealt with that. Um, I could look at the loan and compare it to revenue and profit. But there's two reasons I'm not going to do that. I'm not saying that the two million number is wrong. That's one reason. And secondly, loans go on balance sheets. Why would I compare them to revenue and profit? Both of which are in profit or loss. It makes no sense. Let's move on. The new finance director has informed the audit partner that since the year end, there has been an increased number of sales returns that in the month of May, over half a million of goods sold in April were returned. Another one I am tempted to do straight away. <coughs> now, there's quite a few risks that come out of this. Because if sales in April half a million of them have been returned in May, well, they shouldn't be in the sales figure anymore, should they? They're not real sales. So sales and receivables at year end, at risk of overstatement of 0.5 million, as these sales were cancelled post year end. <coughs> we have a number, 0.5 million over, oh, what was it, 35.6? Oh, you've forgotten already. 35.6 and 0.5 divided by 35.6, uh, 1.4, 1.4 and 8.5, both of which our material. When you're doing materiality calculations, don't just do the numbers, do make a point of concluding whether it's material or not. Well, I need to go back and look and see if they've cancelled these things out. Inspect list of year-end receivables. 
uh, or I suppose posterior end adjustments made to verify these sails removed from the year end figures. Now that is not the only risk that comes from that. It said sales returns. <clears throat> Could it be that these items are being returned because the products are perhaps faulty? And if you think that is the reason, that might suggest that there are other items sold that are faulty which have not yet been returned. It might also suggest that there are items in year-end inventory that are faulty, but we don't know yet because they've not been sold and no one's found out. So there could be issues here with provisions, inventory valuation, all sorts. Now, we've reached 8.45. Uh, we've still got at uh, least two or three more risks to deal with. <clears throat> we've also got the two risks from earlier that I went straight past. Although you can already tell, if you can find nicer ones in the middle, you can ignore the ones that are harder anyway. But rather than try and force into finishing this when we're already at 8.45, I think it would be wisest to take a breather. Stop at that point. And make sure we've actually learned something from what we're doing here. <coughs> we will carry on and finish that question in Monday's second class and use it as a way of reviewing our knowledge. But let's just do a little of that already. As I was explaining those risks, I was making a point of saying which figures or disclosures in the accounts were at risk of being wrong, under or overstatement, although notice at least one of them was not about the number, it was where the number was being put, classification. Which items, under or over, Try to explain the accounting rules as to why, and if there are numbers, calculate materiality. It's a very simple formula, guys. Just got to remember to do it in a very mechanical way, because the danger with these scenario questions is when you're halfway through reading them, your brain starts getting tired, and all you can think about is accounting rules, and you forget the other bits of the technique. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the first revision class, so we will stop at that point. I will see you again on Monday for class number two, when we shall continue with this. We've got another risk question we need to look at as well, and then we'll be heading into internal controls. But for now, thank you all very much. Enjoy your weekend, study hard, and I'll see you on Monday for class number two. Bye-bye. Thank you.